So I'm going to talk about uh, the recent work we are doing, uh, the recent work we've done, work we're doing at the moment, and sort of work backwards. Um, and I'll try and touch on some of the broad things that um, we either need to encounter or want to encounter uh, in practice. The first um, section on collaborations is a challenge really to what we generally think about when we're designing in the context of a school environment. We, we rarely have to deal with the complexities of um, uh, what it takes to build uh, buildings and the fact that we're not alone as architects. It's a very strange uh, situation you're put in when you're being asked to, often on a single project to work as an individual on really complex things. We're generally when you're out in practice, that would be done by a whole host of people in collaboration. So you're unfairly put upon to be experts uh, and generalists when, in fact, there's a reliance on uh, other consultants uh, it, where you're working together towards a common goal. The main collaborator in your projects is your client, of course, and without a good, good client, you can never have a good building. So this first project is one that we're just finishing construction, and this is a co-housing project. So as a model of producing housing, it challenges the state of quo where housing estates are provided by the big house builders, your Bovis, the Wimpies, the Persimmons, and they don't know who they're designing for um, and they don't know the people that are gonna move in and they say that they know what people want but in fact people don't know what they want because there's no choice because it's all provided by one single uh, house builder or a set of house builders that all have this, a very similar kind of model. This model is fundamentally different. It's sometimes known as intentional communities, co-housing, uh, where a group of people get together to um, design and build the neighborhood in which they will live. And there's some basic tenets that are common. This is a, a, um, a, an idea that started in Scandinavia. It's, it's, it's about 5% of the houses in, in Denmark are co-housing communities. There's quite a lot in in America now, and there's about 10 in this country. Some of the things that are, are common are the idea of shared facilities or shared accommodation. So the houses are grouped around a, a common, uh, what's known as a common land, it's basically a big uh, garden that's owned by everyone, some of it's productive. And in the center, there's a common house. So it's like a tiny communal community room, I suppose. This is about 45 houses, so as a as a place, it's for about uh, you know, 80 or 80 to 130 people might be living in this uh, community. It's, um, and uh, as a way, we, we actually won it in competition uh, with the developer and we had to figure out how to answer a brief where in effect there's 40 different people wanting 40 bespoke houses, which is very complicated. And we came up with a solution of providing custom build houses uh, where there's a common front to back uh, dimension. So we can build simple terraces where you've either got a, a A type, B type or C type that grow in size. And then within that, they can be split up into different, uh, different configurations. So in total, the possible ways to configure a house was something like 278, I think it was. So out of a single house, uh, or a way of creating a street, there are multiple possibilities. So it caters for lots of different kinds of people in a simple street-based model. And then there's separate apartments. Um, we also, it's a, a community that involves people from uh, young uh, couples to people with children, to families, to old people. So within that 120 people that will be living there, there's a whole cross-section of society. And they often talk about the idea of uh, a child having many parents in a, in, in a, in a society that, or a small uh, uh, society like, like this where there's a place where there's a creche that they have as part of the common house. <clears throat> the, 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 the apartments were designed around the principles of happy, if you've come across that, housing for the aging population, where it involves a degree of, of social cohesion, there's a single entrance, there's a connection to common areas. Um, so it's a street-based architecture. This is, this is looking at, in effect, making what is the ordinary background uh, to uh, uh, our cities. It's houses that make up streets and streets make up our cities. 
um, we're often we're often encouraged at architecture school to think about um, uh, buildings being particular as opposed to general. Actually, the general stuff is something that architects, I think, should be dealing with as well. So this is the our, 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 our first collaboration. It's both our clients are both town who are the developers who have their own particular interest. The uh, manufacturer of the timber frame prefabricating housing, which is coming from Sweden. So we've been over to Sweden and we, we visited the factory and we have to understand the ways in which we can use their systems in designing the houses. And most particularly, the group of people for whom we're going to be designing the houses for are our prime collaborators where we've had many, many workshop meetings. Second project is uh, another collaborative act, this time with different architects and um, uh, consultants on an on a urban extension to Cambridge. So the detailed model there within the general model is the bit that my practice model ended up designing in detail. This is a, the client for this was the University of Cambridge and they had an extension on the northwest side of Cambridge of what will be evidently a billion pounds over 25 years, but it will be a quarter uh, it's a new quarter of Cambridge. It, overall, the, num the population uh, of this new area will be about a quarter of the current population of Cambridge. And they're designing the centre first. So the thing that's um, uh, very um, notable about this development is um, that you can see on the small left-hand side, it's a, that's a, a whole district with um, something like 5,000 uh, homes and uh, you know, shopping centre, healthcare, a lot of research facilities for the uh, university, in the centre of which there's um, you know, a, a, a recreation area, cricket pitch, community centre, um, school, you know, it's a whole new part of, of town. And what they're doing is building the center of it first. And because the university is the owner of the land and is going to retain that ownership, which is extremely unusual in the way in which our, our new towns are procured, it, it, they're usually built by developers and sold on rather than retained. So most of the towns that we understand and the way in which they function today were built in an era when the municipality put in the infrastructure and owned the fabric. In, and that's very unusual now. The difference, the difference here is about that ownership of the, uh, the long-term ownership of the, of the town, which means that they're able to um, invest in a way that most places are not able to. So the, uh, they're putting in a, a, a supermarket at the beginning of the development. They're putting in a primary school and a healthcare at the beginning of the development. They've got a center of it with a market square with shops. Now, normally those things don't go in because it's commercially not possible until there is at least 1,500 or 2,000 homes. So that's the problem with most what feel like dormitory developments, which are nothing there but housing. They don't feel like a real place because they don't have the cross-section of what makes up what we understand to be a real place. So it's a privilege to be working in such an, a, a new development where, again, it's about the quality and interests of the client, not the architect, that make such things possible. The other aspect of this, which is really unusual, is the, the scale of development. This is on the edge of a city, which is predominantly two or three stories uh, tall. There's some buildings that are taller, but they're generally the important ones like the University Library or the, or the King's College Chapel. Sustainable development, if you're going to, which primarily it means living in denser neighbourhoods where you are reliant upon public transportation rather than private transportation to get around. <clears throat> and there's a great pressure against extending towns in a way that are bigger or more different to the existing uh, conurbation that's there. So for the university to persuade the local authority that building more densely and, to, and at a greater height than the existing historic fabric is incredibly notable. And the, 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 
consequences of that is that you, it feels like a, a, an urban environment. It feels slightly strange at the moment because it's not surrounded by the houses that will eventually make this place work. So you've got a market square without much going on, without many people there. You've got the scale of streets that are going to be appropriate for 5,000 people that at the moment they've only got something like a, a, a thousand, um, I think there's about 300 homes that have been delivered. <clears throat> so of this development, uh, that's, uh, our, our part of it was uh, designing um, 42 um, duplex apartments, but it's all affordable housing in, in this first stage of development. So it's not market housing, it's affordable housing. They're building at the beginning the things that aren't going to give them revenue, which again, as a university, uh, is something they're able to do or able to fund. And we're also building the healthcare uh, so on the ground floor facing, the ground two floors uh, facing the main uh, street is a healthcare centre. Um, so that's the, so it's a, a central, uh, a central access with staircase and a lift which then has uh, apartments which are accessed off a, uh, off a deck. So that's the south facing building onto a courtyard. Now we designed this in collaboration with Wilkinson Air. In fact, as a small business, it's very difficult to get bigger work. Uh, one of the real problems as a business is how you get work. And uh, on it, to make that even more hard, it's how you get work that you haven't done before. To have someone entrust you with their, in this case, 8.5 million quid for something that you can't say that you've done before is really difficult. And one of the ways as a small practice is to ride on the back of a bigger practice who in effect take the risk. So we were asked by uh, Wilkinson Air, in fact the university asked Wilkinson Air if they would work with us, thankfully they said yes. So we were designing the whole of lot one, which involved the healthcare, the, um, the supermarket, the energy centre, and about 120 apartments um, together with Wilkinson Air. And at one point we split it up in order to make a, uh, it a, a, a more um, or easier to do the amount of work that needed to be done. That's the uh, street elevation onto, onto the main street with the healthcare centre. And that's the corner tower with the um, uh, main entrance. So this is accommodation for university staff. There might be uh, administrative staff, there might be postgraduate students. They all have a, 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 an a income of under 40,000 pounds to qualify for renting these apartments. Or a joint uh, yeah, income under 40,000, I think it is. And that's it just finished. So the planting has only just gone in there before people have moved in. It'd be very interesting to see how these buildings are in five years time. These were all built to code level five, which is the highest level of sustainability in what is now the defunct uh, code for sustainable homes, which means that the levels of thermal comfort, the levels of daylighting, they're all incredibly, incredibly high. You have to work very hard to make sure all those things work. And there was a relatively limited budget on this building, so um, we had to be pretty uh, restricted in the uh, amount of special things that we put in the building. <clears throat> it, these are basically single aspect buildings because they face onto, uh, south facing onto a garden, but the rear of them faces onto the energy centre and the service yard for the, um, for the uh, supermarket. So it's a very urban situation. Be very interesting to see how this actually works over time and how people use these uh, spaces at the front of the building and the, the level of privacy that we designed in. They're duplex, so there's never bedrooms facing onto uh, access decks. We hope people will start occupying those spaces and make a space between the public access. There's only ever going to be 10 people who are going to be using that deck, but nevertheless, it's a different way that we're used to living. As part of that aspect of collaboration, uh, there were 13 different architects and probably about 30 different consultants working on this first phase, uh, which is about 120, 150 million pounds, uh, delivering about 300 houses and all those other facilities I've talked about. This was masterminded by a, a master planner, Jonathan Rose at ACOM. And the idea as part of the design process that we'd all talk to each other, show each other what we were doing, sharing what happened. So we were all giving our three-dimensional, you know, 3D models to a common uh, uh, that were held in common by ACOM and they would then reflect that back to us so we could have conversations with our partner architects who were designing on the other side of the street. That's Mechanu's building on the other, other side of the street. That's us bounded by 
Wilkinson Air. And then we'd have common discussions about materials, so we'd all choose what we were doing and then throw them in the pot and find out what it actually was that we were producing. So there was a sense of some kind of uh, control as we went through it. And again, those models were updated through the process, so we understood uh, how, the, how the overall place was going to appear. Spinning out from that project, we then did another project for the affordable, um, uh, for the market housing. Uh, this was a developer pitch that we uh, weren't successful in, in winning, but it was a very useful exercise for us to work with another, pra a bigger practice that you'll be familiar with around here, of, of um, Field and Clegg Bradley and Fist Studio, who are another interesting, smaller practice. And this is a project where um, this was for about um, uh, 400 uh, houses uh, in different forms, market housing. Um, and it was being driven, in effect, by the uh, returns that the developer was going to make, which then determines what money they can offer for the land. So it was a land bid offer. So in terms of collaborations, um, one of the really critical things to understand at this point is how we're working with the developers because we're only going to win if the developer can offer more money for the land than the other developers. So we're trying to figure out how we can get maximum return whilst producing uh, an environment that is good for people to live in. We didn't win because someone else offered more money. They put 5% more uh, accommodation on the site and the developer for that uh, bid won it, uh, Hill Residential, gambled that the returns on the value of the housing was 7% more than our developer was working out on. So 5% and 7% on top of that meant that there was a significant difference in the financial return that this developer was considering this, work, this site would give them. So they didn't win the job. But that, that, that kind of conversation goes along these ones about what kind of places we're making, how you deal with cars. So on this one with three different architects, we. Uh, split up the site after doing an exercise on the master planning in terms of different ways we could um, uh, think about uh, how uh, people might, or how we could divide up urban blocks. On this one, slightly similar to the co-housing project, there was a common garden with individual private gardens. The common garden sitting above an underground car park. And then these were the larger houses, so there was um, upper floors with um, uh, garden spaces on the upper floors. In some of the other blocks, this was Fifth Studios uh, blocks they were taking on, where we looked at a muse configuration where the cars were in a backland muse and that muse was then overlooked by small accommodation at the end of the houses. They were long, thin houses with small courtyards and at the end of the house was a garage and then accommodation above the garage that could be used for multiple uses as an extension of the house. And then at the southern end of the site, there were taller apartment buildings where the car parking was on top of a, was underneath a, a podium. So there was podium uh, garden sitting above grade level parking. A lot of the, the uh, drivers for dense urban housing start with how you're going to deal with your car parking. Car parking levels were quite low on this site because we were arguing that we were close to the centre of Cambridge, which has very good sustainable travel connections. But with the kind of densities that we were looking at doing, it was driving a sense of an urban environment that was um, the opposite to what normally happens on the, on the edge of a town when we're talking about uh, more um, uh, usual developer-led uh, schemes. And one of the advantages of collaborating with other architects is you get a greater sense of, of, of difference between uh, one part of the development, development and another. There's not a uniform quality. It's more like we're, we're, we're familiar with in the way in which towns are developed over time. A big part of the work that we've done over years um, is thinking about sustainability, in particular energy and timber. We're working on a project at the moment with um, a, a developer called Knight Dragon, uh, just behind the O2 on the Greenwich Peninsula, which is a really interesting development where eight architects are doing two buildings each. The buildings are workspace buildings. They're designed, it's called the creative, it, it's it, the design for the creative industries. It's known as the design district, it's just behind the O2. And it's the center of a huge area of new uh, housing, mostly in tall blocks. So the idea is to, uh, for, of the developers is to 
make this an enclave uh, that is full of interesting things going on, which will give character to the area overall. So these buildings are all inexpensive. Um, they're inexpensive so that they can keep the rents low and then they can attract the kind of um, uh, small scale creative companies to, to work in that area. We were interested within that context of making um, simple buildings out of timber. We're thinking about the kind of warehouse spaces that uh, we've enjoyed being in as, as, um, as creative uh, people ourselves. These are the conceptual models that we made of the two buildings. They're both clad in metal made out of timber, so these kind of jewelry box quality, uh, where there's a, a, a warmth on the inside, that they have a crafted feel to them. Um, that's the piles that they sit on, that the piles go through the made up ground. <coughs> and, and the two buildings, one of them is a, a, a glue lamb timber frame with uh, SIPs panels um, the, uh, with, so there's a sense of exposed timber on the inside of the building. The other one is, uh, similar, is a fully uh, cross-laminated timber building, it's a rhomboid, rhomboid shape which gives a kind of diagonal in the room with an interesting uh, butterfly ceiling with corner triangular uh, roof lights on the top floor. And both of them are made out of fairly uh, simple straightforward timber uh, structures. In terms of sustainability, timber is, of course, a sustainable material to use, but one of the difficulties of using timber on an, in, a, in a big space is, is how to stop it overheating. It doesn't have a lot of thermal mass, which means that once uh, you get heat buildup, either through uh, intense occupation by people or through solar gain, it's very difficult for it to be absorbed in the fabric. In order to persuade your clients to make a building perform, you have to know about the science behind uh, the performance of the building. So we always work with uh, M&E consultants who um, give us the data, but it's a question of getting your clients to understand what the data means. So we have to understand it and we have to take our clients through it in order for them to know what the issues are. So these are diagrams which show overheating uh, over the course of uh, a year and then this is over the course of uh, a week in the middle of a, of a uh, speculative time in the middle of summer when it's likely to overheat using current data. <clears throat> and the, there's two straight lines, the levels th within the SIPSI guidance that, of thermal comfort, the, the ideal thermal comfort of 24 degrees and the higher level comfort of 28 degrees, after which it's deemed to become too hot. Uh, <clears throat> and um, the, the wobbly lines there are how the building is likely to perform over the course of the week, going hotter in the day and colder in the night. And the different, different colors are different options that we were showing our clients as to how we could make the building perform better. And what it's showing is that uh, all these are within the SIPSI guidance. So the SIPSI guidance allows the building to overheat for a certain number of days or hours in a year. And to make a client understand what they're getting for their money is really important if you don't want to come back and say, hang on, our tenants are saying it's, it's uh, boiling hot in there and we're going to install air conditioning because your building's no good. So to take them through it and say, actually, it is going to overheat, what we advise is to do something about it now rather than waiting for people to complain. So as part of that process, we took them through the, the use of, um, uh, of um, using phase change materials as part of the strategy. So it's getting a material which it acts more like concrete. So a concrete building, like going into a cave, will absorb, absorb heat. It stays more stable as a temperature. A phase change material does that by the latent heat and the transfer of the material from a solid to a liquid and then back to a solid again. It's, it's embedded into a plasterboard, so like the panels on the wall around you, it's, it's, it's a, a sheet material that can uh, absorb heat and, and let it out in the day. It's expensive, but not as expensive as, as post-occupancy uh, installing air conditioning. The other thing that's absolutely essential to do is to make sure that you guard against solar, solar overheating in the first instance by employing external shutters, which is something that this country is very poor about, but when you go to Southern Europe, it's absolutely familiar. Germany doesn't have a, uh, doesn't have a, a particularly different uh, climate to ours, and yet external shutters are very commonly seen. <clears throat> this was uh, the University of Cambridge uh, studio uh, for the architecture department we did about 10 years ago, which was uh, 
a similar kind of building. It was, uh, the, the, it was actually designed as a temporary building and the department wanted to make it a sustainable low energy building with low embodied energy made out of timber. It was an inexpensive building, so it was all made out of sort of standard uh, components. The vast majority of it was um, standard timber that could be bought in a, uh, uh, ordered in, so not manufactured timber. There's a glue lamp frame which holds it together. <clears throat> it's a, a building that was again designed for in, in, in a very high uh, uh, daylighting, so it's a daylighting factory of 4.5 in the studio space, which is absolutely fantastic. Those top light north windows were absolutely part of the strategy to keep the building comfortable in the summer. So there's windows that you open on the north at the top and there's low windows that are surrounding the building at, the lo at low level. So you can see the strip windows along the side there that are all open at kind of waist height. So you get draft which comes through from the uh, low level on the north, south and west sides and it vents out through the north lights. Similar to the uh, diagram that I showed you before, this was a diagram we worked with Max Fordham uh, that was again talked through with the, the client about uh, why it's important to put certain measures in in order to stop the building overheating. The, the bar on the left, the exceedance, that's the same thing. It's, it's exceeding the SIBC guidance where you have a permitted level of, exceed, of exceedance and if you go above it, you're likely to feel uncomfortable. So the base case scenario was what we wanted to do there, which was to put in uh, uh, cooling because we, in modelling it, realised that without cooling the building was going to overheat in the middle of summer. <clears throat> and you can see as you go through that, that um, each of the scenarios, then no cool is on the right hand side, which shows that if you, if you take out the cooling, you get a really significant exceedance above, above the SIPSI guidance. So how to do that in a sustainable way, not putting in air conditioning and using uh, more CO, producing more CO2? was using water. Now water has the highest thermal capacity of any known substance by volume, which means it can absorb more energy than anything else. It's also uh, more or less free and everyone knows how to use it. So they were embedded in ceiling panels um, and uh, you can see on the ground on the left hand side there are ceiling panels which is a kind of a, a gypsum panel with little, the red there is little um, tubes which have uh, water flowing through them and that then produces a radiant cooling in the ceilings. The water only has to be two or three degrees lower than the uh, temperature surrounding, uh, surrounding us in order to give you a radiant heat exchange. So working, working backwards as a practice we've done uh, houses over many years. It's how I started. I built my own house um, and there's a real pleasure to that. It's something that everyone understands. Um, we've managed to work, this is Peter Zamthor's house in, in, in Devon that we've been uh, working on for the past six years, which is uh, very close to completion. We've done a number of houses where we've acted as, as um, the executive architect doing the construction phase work for foreign architects for a, a organization called Living Architecture which has been another kind of collaboration where uh, we're happy not to take design responsibility. We are interested in working with architects with, uh, you know, we, we have great admiration for and assisting them in building their project. This was uh, working with Winnie Mass of MVRDV for a house in Suffolk that projected 18 meters over the end of a cliff. So by the end of the living room, you're, you're something like eight or nine meters above the, the ground. Uh, and working with Yarmon Vigsnes of uh, uh, in uh, JVA in um, in Norway, so the uh, architects from Oslo, and we went over there, visited them in their practice, went to see their work, uh, and we were assisting them in going through the planning process and ultimately doing the work in drawings uh, with them to get, and then working with the contractors to get them get them built. It's been a really fascinating process in order to be part of a bigger whole. There's no need to entirely take responsibility to get a great deal um, out of any one project. Uh, this was a house that we completed last year that uh, won the Stephen Lawrence Award last year uh, for architect and developer Roger Zagolovich. This was um, 
uh, it's a holiday house. You can stay there if you've got enough money. Uh, and it was a building by the sea next to a house that was built around uh, the second class lounge of the SS Mauritania. There's a house built in the 1930s, and there's a, which is Roger's existing house. And that house had a fantastic sense of surprise. You went into a modernist 30s box, you walk through the door, and you're, surround, and you're, you're immediately come across a circular void uh, with little bunk beds around the top, top, looking down into this fantastic bit of joinery, which was a reclaimed, salvaged uh, part of a, a, an old liner. And we wanted to make a building that had a, a similar kind of quality to it, that had a surprise to it. It's inverted in that you come in at the ground level and we wanted to go up for the views. And in terms of the way in which the building sat on the site, um, it, it lent itself to a, a curved plan in order to deal with the tree, trees on the one side and the adjacent property on the other. So it has a deliberately slightly nautical quality to it. It's curved in plan and faceted in, in elevation, so it's relatively complex, but it's not a, it's not a, um, a double curvature building. <clears throat> so you enter on, it's a half level, it's a split level plan. You enter on in the ground floor and then go down to the bedrooms, that's, where, that's the littlest bedroom. And then uh, that's the hallway where you come in, there's a curved wall on your right hand side and above you is a ceiling from the room above. And behind that is the master bedroom with its curved and canted wall. And then as you step into the hallway, you look up a half a level, um, and that goes up into the first part of the living floor. And from that living floor, you then look across to the next one, and then above your he head is the final third, third level. So it was a real uh, joy to be able to work. As a holiday house, you have a different set of circumstances, and the configuration can be slightly freer than a normal house. <clears throat> but it was the idea behind it was a sense of uh, boat hulls leaning up one against another and a resonance of um, uh, seaside architecture with exposed uh, aggregate concrete with a building that had a sense of freedom, something about boat, boat building, quality of, of uh, we thought, the inside of a whale, the belly of a whale. One thing that's always interested me is, is making. So that's the house under construction, which has a concrete uh, frame, like a portal frame, uh, around the centre of the building, which then uh, allows the Douglas fir uh, portals to sit against, against that. And working with individual contractors, and in the case of the timber frame, with a company called the Timber Frame Company, for them to help us in thinking about the geometry is really important with the living architecture houses to work with Jane Wernick, uh, engineer, to think about how, how these buildings are made, looking at how we can get the finest of uh, constructional sections on the perimeter of um, the building on the beach for Yarmon Vigsne, um, which meant a lot of, a lot of uh, reinforcement in the cantilevered structure. Working with specialist timber subcontractors to work on the geometry of the upper floor out of CLT. Or with, again, Jane Wernick engineers to figure out how you get a, a, a cantilevered 18 meter long uh, house sticking over the edge of a cliff, which basically means one massive great counterweight uh, and a bridge construction. Or with uh, Peter Zumthor's practice of doing endless samples of, of uh, rammed concrete to get the right mix of material to both perform structurally in the way it needs to, but also have the aesthetic qualities that Zumthor was after. And working with individual trades on site to figure out how we make details work, such as that, uh, the, the hanging, hanging of the upper floor in the boathouse, or coming up with joinery and working with, in this case, Haroy's uh, joinery company in making the timber screen at the end of the boathouse. These are uh, conversations that can't be had alone. They must be a part of a, a, a working with people who know how the performance over t of timber over time uh, works, um, which allow us to make adjustments to our first assumptions in order to get the building uh, working over time. As part of our exploration of uh, making, I've done uh, uh, for the last 10 years, most years, uh, with Piers Taylor 
and a whole load of other architects, we've ran a, a making session, which is just four days, called Studio in the Woods, where we go on site. Uh, every, every time we've done it, we've been working in a, in a wood where we've been able to use the thinnings from the construction. And uh, we put our order in to the, uh, to the mobile sawmill and get the timber that we decide collectively we need to make the project. So the first day is usually coming up with an idea, getting the timber sawn in the mobile sawmill, and then we have two frantic days of putting it together. This one was a, a grid shell uh, that was laid out flat on the ground, used um, uh, cable ties to put it together and um, put it up in the woods. This was Jenny Botsford and, and Kate Darby who teaches at Cardiff. This was a device for measuring the light coming through the sky of a canopy in a timber. <clears throat> this was uh, in a woods last year where we were looking at what we could do with oak trees that are uh, um, uh, all of uh, uh, crooked sectioned oak trees. Um, this was all slotted construction and basically it's an, it's an indication of what you can do in a certain number of, of days. This was years ago now but it was looking at, at, at making simple, uh, simple cantilevered uh, trusses. This was um, another year where we were looking at uh, when we started to take health and safety more seriously and looked at how we could uh, make trusses on the ground and then elevate them into position, which got, uh, got us thinking about the sequence of construction and how, that, how important that is to think that through at the beginning in order to be able to have something at the end which it, it takes consideration of how things are built. This is Peter Clegg and Ted Cullinan Shinegasira, at, um, that's the little uh, bird hide uh, 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 shelter. So we've always invited interesting architects to come uh, and um, Peter and Ted have come most years to then give us their wisdom at the end of the day. I'm working backwards in time. Uh, we're now about 10, 12 people. Um, at this point I was probably about five, seven people. and. Um, we, I was fortunate in, in getting good clients who wanted really interesting houses. So most of the work was residential. Partly it was because I stuck my neck out and built my own house, which got um, quite a lot of attention. So that enabled me to uh, get in contact with other uh, people who wanted something interesting. And that takes some balls, I think, in that I, I was fortunate. I'm of a generation that was able to buy property uh, relatively young. Uh, which I then sold and bought a piece of land and this was the first house that I designed for myself which was on a piece of land that ultimately I decided to move out of London but I sold but um, not before I'd then taken options on three adjacent pieces of land beside it that were owned by three different people and got planning permission for eight houses instead of one and sold on which then gave me the money to in effect start my practice and build my house. So most of the work initially was um, extensions um, to uh, small buildings and it's a question of trying to persuade each and every client that they can do something more than they thought they could and they can uh, get more for their money or that they can get the kind of place they'd never dreamed of in order to get what I want out of the job which then in turn gets me better clients to do the next thing that I want to do. These were both extensions to listed projects. This was a artist studio which cost £30,000 which um, uh, I think this was shortlisted for the AJ Small Projects. There's another one we did for another artist that won the Small Projects, uh, the AJ Small Projects Award. So these things if you work hard and you have a vision can get you some kind of uh, presence which then gets you to the next uh, stage. So uh, uh, Elena, her name was, came to us and said I've looked around and what you can get for 30000 is miserable and um, it's such a lot of money, you know, can you do something which has a bit of soul to it? And so with a bit of invention, of course, as architects, we can deliver something that's far, far, far better than what's available as a standard product on the market. This was the first, uh, first building that I did that was ever published in the AJ. This was the studio that won the Architects Journal Small Projects. This was actually built for uh, £3,000 I think or £6,000. It was all reclaimed materials. I was teaching at Cambridge at the time and three of my students come and helped build it in the summer. It was three A3 drawings, hand drawings that built that. 
I could have put this category anywhere, of course, as you can see that going through the workers um, you've seen, uh, there's at no point where we don't feel like we have something to learn. We're always seeking to do something that we haven't quite done before. We're always, in some ways, living by the seat of our, uh, our pants. For me, to do something, uh, to do something different or to challenge myself keeps me engaged. So now I'm more interested in aspects of the city or more complex attitudes towards or aspects of what it make, takes to make a place. Um, and, um, you know, that's actually very, very complicated. Earlier on, we talked about having to understand the motivations of our developers and what makes them win a project, uh, which is another whole aspect to, to learn. But I put this in, I think before I was, I, I had a practice for a few years before I got qualified and uh, I did many of these small projects that were working with small builders um, and actually it was an amazingly good way to learn, doing over and over again, working from beginning to end of a project that was very short, understanding uh, what kind of information that I needed to give for small builders to make it work and spent a lot of time on building sites. Uh, uh, then it was all blokes, now it's mostly blokes on building sites, but there's, there's many more consultants and more, more women on building sites now. Uh, and this was before the era where you had to have welfare facilities. Um, so that was, I spent a long time on, on building sites. Um, I spent two years as a construction manager uh, working on a couple of, of different sites where actually it was all a pretty uh, dodgy where I'd show up on Friday with a wad of cash in my pocket and pay the laborers. And that was a pretty interesting uh, way to understand how things uh, get done, who you, need to, uh, who you need to know is going to be there on a Monday morning in order to know you've got the bit of work that you need to get done by the Friday. Before that I worked, at, uh, worked abroad in, in Taiwan, which is a different kind of education. This was in 1990 to 1993, where it was the, the last recession that happened here where no one had any work and I went abroad. That was fantastic in that the kind of way in which things happened was much, much more rapid than, than here. Regulation was uh, far looser. Uh, contracts were much more about a relationship between people than a written contract. And the way in which things were made was far more immediate. So you could do a drawing in the morning, you could give it to the contractor, and in the afternoon you could go down to the metalworking shop and they'd be out, usually in the street rather than in a building, welding together what you'd drawn in the morning. So it was a very, very immediate way to uh, understand uh, the relationship between drawing and making. I worked in the theatre for a while when I was studying architecture. I thought it all took too long. Um, I couldn't bear to wait, so actually I've gone backwards in time, so things have got shorter as, and projects have got smaller, and that's no mistake. I didn't want to work in a big practice immediately because doing something that took three years was unimaginable to me. And in fact, working in the theatre was fantastic and another fantastic learning tool. You have maybe £3,000, perhaps 5000 or £8,000, and it has to happen within eight weeks. That's the kind of scenario you're in. There is a deadline, it's not going to change. Actually, as a way to train up for becoming an architect, that was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Um, so I set up a company with um, a dance theatre company with a choreographer and, a, a, and a, a, a musician in Ireland. And we were lucky at the time in Ireland, we were putting a lot of money into the arts. This was in the Royal uh, Hospital Kilmainham, which is their Museum of Contemporary Art, which we transformed into a, a, a venue for performance over a series of um, uh, five different rooms and had something like two months to rehearse, devise, uh, make and perform. Before that, I lived in the States and thought I'd become a painter. I did quite a lot of things like this, which I liked. I did more things like that, which sold well. And after my degree, I set up a company called the, the Finsbury Plan which was named after Lubetkin's great socialist plan for Thimsbury, which was built a couple of buildings in the healthcare centre. And we did exhibition design. This was at the Crafts Council uh, Gallery. And this one 
was at the Royal Academy. That's uh, CZWG, and um, second from the right is Roger Zagolovich, who later on became my client for the houseboat. So context is everything in architecture. Without context, you have no work. This was a sketch for the uh, exhibition at the Royal Academy and the finished one. This is the first job we ever did. Uh, this was called Flat for Neil. This was in the post-punk era of 1983. Um, this was the, a light feature and entrance door to Neil's flat. And this was my second year project at the University of Sheffield for a, a competition for Cherry Garden Pier, the south bank of the Thames. Uh, where I was heavily influenced by Aldo Rossi and having just come back from Venice on holiday. And that uh, is me in 1981, somewhere where you are now. Thanks. <laughs>